If you've got your Bible with you this morning, I'd encourage you to join me in 2 John. Uh, it is a really tiny book hidden amongst some other really tiny books, so the easiest way to find it, go to the last book in your Bible, Revelation, and then just flip a few pages back and you will find it there. Now, as you're looking for it, uh, I got to say I'm super excited to get to preach this passage today. Uh, even though we're only going to be looking at three verses, verses 4, 5, and 6 today, we're going to see that these are really passages that are connected to a much bigger and much more important part of Christian life. And today what we're really talking about is loving one another in the truth. And this is a message I'm, I'm glad to give today because, as many of you know, I'm going to be going on sabbatical for the next few months, and it's an opportunity for me to bring us back to you before I go to this idea of what it looks like to aspire to be the people that Jesus wants us to be by loving one another. What does it look like for you to be loved? What does it look like for you to love someone else? If you're like me, the answer probably varies wildly depending on the situation. You know, it might vary day to day how I'm feeling, how I want to be loved. It varies relationship to relationship for what I'm looking for and what I'm giving in those relationships. And then there's some other things that just seem to always be consistent. Now, typically, when I think of this idea of loving someone else, I typically go to something called the five love languages. Many of you are probably familiar with them. And when I do uh, marriage counseling or premarital work, I often bring couples to this idea that for most of us, we have one or two primary love languages. To help us appreciate them, though, uh, I've come across this illustration to think about our love languages in terms of tacos. And so for some of us, words of affirmation are how we give love and receive love. So it's nice to hear, nice to say that your tacos are delicious. For others of us, it's an act of service. And so when we give love this way, we say, here, I made you some tacos. For others, it's uh, this receiving the gift and then quality time of going out for tacos and then physical touch. I want to hold you like a taco. <laughs> right? We can all relate in some sort of way where many of us know what it looks like to receive love for sure. Most of us could easily go, oh, I'm that one or those two are my primary sort of things. And maybe if you're in tune with those around you, perhaps it's a significant other or a close family friend, you know what their love languages are too, and you try to express care for them in a certain way. But while love languages and tacos are both pretty great, that's not at all what Jesus tells us. It's not at all what the Apostle John instructs us to do here in today's passage. Instead, we will see something that builds upon a legacy of teaching from the Apostle John into the life of Jesus. So let's take a look at it in 2 John, and we're going to read verses 4 to 6. John says this, It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his commandment is that you walk in love. As we're continuing on in this short little letter, where we find ourselves is coming right out of sort of an initial introduction. And in that introduction, verses 1 to 3, we saw that John, is, who calls himself the elder in this situation, is writing to his church and the people who make up that church. And he calls the church the lady or the elect lady, and then he calls the people her children. And so what he's doing is he's reminding them of what it looks like to walk in love and in the truth of Jesus. 
We've come to this letter right out of a slightly bigger letter that John wrote to the churches, 1 John, where he has kind of wrestled with the church through what it looks like to really believe in the person of Jesus for all that that would mean, because there was some division going on in the church. There was some debate about who Jesus was, and as that debate arose, what happened is people got their guards up. People began to make camps. People began to fight one another. And John says, this isn't what it's supposed to be all about. Yes, there's important things and truths we have to do, but as we live in that truth, we also have to walk out some love. We have to live out love. And so John reminds us that while we are people of faith, and truth, people who have a certain knowledge and set of beliefs, we're also supposed to live those things out. And so John paints a picture with this expression that we're walking in the truth. He says, I see that some of you are walking in the truth. Now this idea of walking gives us sort of a realization where John's trying to get us to go. To walk out something, right, is to put it in to action, to have movement from one place to another. He's saying, I don't want your faith in Jesus just to be a mental exercise. It's not just about having the right answer, understanding all the philosophy and theology. I want you to live out of those things in a specific way. Now, like many of you, I have found that the longer people are involved in something or the more conflict they experience in it, the more likely they are to move away from being a part of it to perhaps just being a studier of. For instance, when people first come to faith in Jesus, they're often very passionate. They're very inspired. They want to live out and tell the truth of Jesus' love and what he means for them to everyone around them. They try to aspire to a different way of being. But sadly, for many people, young and old, after a period of time has gone on, what ends up happening is we become more about the philosophy and theology. We like to spend more time in Bible study then living out what we study in the Bible. The same thing is true of the conflict. Like what John was experiencing, these people began to fight about the truth of what it means to understand who Jesus is, that they get up their boxing gloves, they get up their defenses, and instead of actually living out everything else Jesus told them to do, they end up just sort of intellectually sparring with one another. Or, as they get hurt from the conflict, they begin to just sort of disengage and take a back seat. We've probably all, especially those of us who have been in the church for a long time, seen this to one degree or another. And so what John is doing here is he's, first of all, commending those who are actually doing what they're supposed to do. They're walking out the truth of what they believe. And he's at the same time providing sort of inspiration for us to think about what we're going to do with this knowledge of, with this relationship with Jesus. We should be inspired towards action. And that's where we get into verse 5 and 6. Here, John begins to bring it together. He says, and now, dear lady, and now, church... I am not writing to you a new command. I'm not giving you anything new here, but I'm giving you something that we've had since the beginning. And what's he calling back for for the beginning? He's not calling back to the beginning of time. He's not calling back to some point in ancient history just in their church story. What he's calling back to is a relationship with Jesus, the person who has founded the faith and began to build the church. And he says... We've had it since Jesus. He's given us this instruction to love one another. And he says, and this is what love is, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Hear the repetition. That's John really trying to get us to get that he's making a significant point. 
John says that the big part of walking out love or walking out truth is to love one another. And again, this is nothing new to his readers. They're not very distant from the life of Jesus. They are here in the church where John is. And John, of course, is the one who Jesus said, hey, I'm entrusting my mom Mary to you to take care of. And so uh, based on church history, we know it's likely that Mary is involved. Jesus' mom is here within the church. And so there's great stories, I'm sure, of who Jesus is, what it was was like to be with him, all the things that he had to say, all of even his growing up and what it looked like for the God of the universe to live this out from childhood all the way through to his death and resurrection. And they, he says, this is a part of your faith, that it's not just knowing the truth, but it's living love. This is no surprise. Jesus says in John 13, 35, This is how you will know that you are my disciple, by your love for one another. Our love for one another is the marker of whether or not we're really people of faith. Not can we answer the Sunday school questions. Not can we fill in the blank and know where the pastor's going in the message. Not in having the right answers at Bible study and showing that we understand the Greek or the Hebrew or the Aramaic. No. The marker that shows that this is a real part of our lives is our love for one another. And really we know that this is true. This is what shows the integrity of someone's faith. I mean, isn't it true from people you know That you have a sense of sort of where they're at in their faith by the way they live towards others, the way they respond to you. Isn't it true for yourself, like it is for me, that you know that when you're more loving, you're probably walking closer to Jesus than when you're a little bit more on edge, a little bit more combative? This is a marker. And in fact, it's not just a marker for us inside the church, it's a marker for people outside of the church. When I talk to people who have rejected the Christian faith, it very rarely has anything to do with the person of Jesus. It almost always has to do with the people of Jesus. Most people are like, man, I like the concept of this Jesus guy. Sounds pretty great. He sounds amazing. But man, those Christians are real jerks. Man, look at the way they fight with each other. I don't want anything to do with that. Right now in the United States, one of the largest denominations in the world is experiencing record-breaking attrition rates. Over the last few years, since 2006, they've lost 3.5 million members who have walked away from the faith. Over half of that since 2018. The city of Vancouver, the population of the city of Vancouver has walked away. And why? One of the most common responses of is the way we deal with each other, the way we've politicized church, the way we've approached one another in our differing views, right? 2018, let's think what's gone on, right? In the States, you've got election of President Trump, you go forward from there, you've got COVID, all these things that have gone on. And people have begun to battle one another. This is the history, not just in the U.S., but in our own country. Maybe not in quite the same way because we're far more post-Christian culture than they are, but we've done it all along the way. The denominational feuds that have been wars with one another, maybe not literal, but figuratively we know what I'm talking about. The constant battling between one another, even within individual churches over secondary issues. People becoming embroiled in horrendous scandals because we've left out love. One of the things I'm hopeful, though, for is the fact that I'm seeing a turn, at least in the church in Canada, I've seen a significant shift over the last number of years, particularly in the leadership of different denominations who have said, 
look, we've been at war for so long, and look what it's done. We've lost people along the way, and we've turned a whole lot more people off of Jesus. And so there's become this compelling case for working with one another, for loving each other despite some of our secondary differences. And there has become a new sort of practice of churches engaging with each other, at least at the broad levels of church in Canada. And that gets me hopeful. It gets me hopeful because hopefully if it's happening at those levels where often leaders who are the most entrenched in philosophy and theology, who have the most difference of opinion, if they can get along, maybe too can we do it in the local church. I think we can. But what does it look like for this change to happen? What would it look like for a church to really be made up of people loving one another. And I'm talking about more than knowing the name of the person who walks through the door. More of than just having a casual conversation where we feel like someone has talked to us this week. What does it look like to really love one another? Well, according to Jesus, and according to his protege, Jean, To love one another is this, in verse 6. He said, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to Jesus' commands. We best learn to demonstrate our love for one another when we live out the path that Jesus has given us. The commandments that Jesus has given were never given to us to be constraints and rules that just take away all the fun. They were given to us so our lives would be lived within certain parameters so that we would connect with the God of the universe. So we would learn his love and then learn to love others in return in the same way. And in doing so, We provide the best path forward for every single one of us. Did you know that depending on how you count them, there's either 49 or 50 general commands that Jesus gives to his followers in the Gospels? Now, there's many other commands, for instance, when he gives commandments of healing and commandments when he's exercising demons and things like that, but uh, we're not counting those. What we're doing is we're counting the commands that he gives his followers of things to do, and these are the things that help us love one another. And we can, we can think of many of the commands. We can think of the command that Jesus first gives to repent, to turn our lives around from the way that we've been living to the ways of God, to love our enemies, commands to honor our parents, but also commands not to despise little ones, commands to be a people of prayer, to celebrate communion together, to forgive those who have offended us and to be reconciled when we're the offender. These are some of the commandments that Jesus gave. Now, if you're like me, you hear even just those few and you go, wow, I don't know if I can live up to it all. I mean, 50 commandments of Jesus, I can't even keep the first 10 that are in the Old Testament. So what do I do? Well, the good news is, Jesus knows this. That's why he came. It's true, none of us can live up to all of these things that are commanded. It's why Jesus needed to die on the cross. Because none of us are him. Because we'll all do wrong. Because we'll all think the wrong way, act the wrong way, treat people with disrespect. But, because of who he is, and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us, things can begin to shift and change. We can learn to live in the way of Jesus. We can learn to love others. And we can also learn to receive love. That's one of the hardest ones for some of us. 
It's easy to go do the things outward. It's harder to be the recipient in community. But just because it's impossible for us to fulfill all these things doesn't mean we don't try to keep on doing them. In fact, when it comes to love, it's often the thought that counts, isn't it? We say that about gifts, sort of jokingly, but we all know in different relationships that it's often the intention and the effort that goes in that really is what is the deliverance of love. I mean, one thing I've learned for sure from my marriage is that what shows my wife the most love is by trying. Now, I'm pretty terrible at doing a lot of the things my wife asked me to do. For starters, I'm not handy at all. Like, like not at all. My wife is the handy one. There's something to be done around the house. It's probably her fixing it or figuring out how it needs to get undone or whatever. I communicate in a vastly different way than my wife does. Sometimes it seems like we're speaking two different languages when we talk. Add to that, I'm a recovering, self-focused idiot. I'm working on not just making the love about me, but the love about her too. Add to that, I'm an academically gifted, but sometimes not that street smart individual. Honestly, I'm pretty absurd in a lot of ways. But what I have learned and what my wife has learned along the way is that it's the intention. It's when I, even though I don't do many of the things perfectly, put my effort in, fruit is still produced. She still has the opportunity to recognize that I'm trying my best to love. And likewise, when she does, other, when she does things for me, even though maybe it's not exactly what I was hoping for or wanting, I know this is love. In the same way, I think the church could be very much changed if we learned to try to love. If we aspired to genuinely, with intention, live out some of these commands. I think our church would really change. I think our church would really flourish. I think we would become a very attractive group of people to those who live in a world that is quite contentious and unloving they would suddenly say, hey, something's different in this place. So the question is, what's stopping us? What's stopping us? Well, for starters, for some of us, it's probably we have no idea what the 50 commandments of Jesus are. And then for others of us, we don't know even where to start. And so for the rest of our time together, that's what I hope that we will begin to experience. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of minutes is I'm going to highlight the 50 commandments of Jesus for each of us. Now, if you're a note taker, you're going, I'm not going to be able to take 50 commandments down. At the back of the room on the, the pedestal tables as you go out is a sheet that I've made up. And it lists all the 50 commands of Jesus with a scripture reference. You're welcome to grab them now. You can grab it as you go. But I encourage you to look at it. But as we go through our time this morning, what I want you to do recognizing that if any of us tries to take on everything, we'll fail. I just want you to pick one. Just look for one of these commands of Jesus that maybe you feel a nudge towards. Take the time to allow the Holy Spirit to maybe prompt something in you. Maybe it's something you used to do, but it's been a long time since it's been done. Maybe it's a command of Jesus you've never really paid attention to, and it's something new to you, and it's an opportunity to explore what Jesus would have for you through that commandment. Maybe it's something you've been resisting, but because of your resistance for a certain reason, you've be had a struggle to love someone. And so what we're going to do, I'm just going to go through all 50. I'm not going to go into the depth, and some of these you'll see are just sort of statements that need to be unpacked by reading the scripture, and so I'll trust that you can do that at home with the scripture references that are on the page. But for now, let's just honor the Lord 
by taking a moment to consider which one, which one Jesus would you have me do as an act of loving those around me? So let me quickly just pray and invite the Holy Spirit to move, and then we'll go through the 50 commandments. Holy Spirit, we invite you to reveal to each one of us where it is that we can grow. God, where can I grow in keeping your commands? God, I want us to learn to love you. God, we want to be your disciples. We want to, we want to be like you. We want to do the things that you did. And so would you help us to learn what it is that's the next step for each one of us? Would you help us learn how we can love others by growing in one particular area? So Holy Spirit, I pray just in some way, would you just, by your supernatural ability, just prompt one of these things in each one of us? So that as we live it out, we would be a community that would be shaped more by your love. That we would resemble you so that people wouldn't say, hey, those people of Jesus are gross, but they would see Jesus in us. Holy Spirit, we give this time to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, are you ready? The 50 commands of Jesus. Number one, repent. Number two, follow him. Number three, rejoice because you are with him. Number four, let your light shine for others to see so that they too may know God. Number five, Jesus commands that we honor God's laws. Number six, that we be reconciled with others. Maybe this is one many of us could probably consider. It's against our culture to admit when we've done wrong. But perhaps we need to own up to the places we've done wrong to break down walls of love. Number seven, do not lust. Again, a huge problem. Huge problem for men and women both in the church. And it's not just that it's a self-focused act for us to get gratification from lusting after others, but it's actually a degradation of others. We turn others into our objects as we lust. Perhaps we're diminishing the image of God in others. Number eight, keep your word. Number nine, go the second mile. 10, love your enemies. 11, be perfect. 12, practice secret disciplines. Jesus urges us to give, to pray, and to fast. Not so that other people would see what we do, but so that we would connect with God and benefit from those actions. Store up treasures in heaven. See God's kingdom first. Judge not. Another problem? Maybe in the church? The way we judge others without first examining what's going on in our own lives and dealing with the issues that we see in ourselves first. Don't throw your pearls to pigs, number 16. Number 17, ask, seek, and knock. Number 18, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 19, choose the narrow way of life. 20, be aware of false prophets. 21, pray for God's labors. Imagine if we actually spent time to contend spiritually for one another as we served God. Prayer isn't something we just do as a shopping list, but it's an act of love. When we engage in spiritual warfare on behalf of one another, as others in our church family serve God, we support them, we encourage them, we join with God and the Holy Spirit in what he's doing in their lives. Maybe there's some power there that's untapped. 22, be wise. 23, fear God, but not man. 24, listen to God's voice. Maybe a lot of hurt would not occur if we listen to God's voice in every situation. 25, take Jesus' easy yoke. 26, honor your parents. And that's not just for the little ones in the room. Sometimes it's harder for older ones of us to honor our parents as we go on. 27, beware of false teaching. 28, deny yourself. 29, don't despise the little ones. Number 30, go to offenders, meaning hold others in community accountable for how they have gone against others and against God. 31, forgive others. It's not just about holding them accountable, and it's the opposite of being reconciled where we go admit what we've done wrong, but in fact, we turn over to forgive others, which takes the poison not out of them, but out of us. 
I think unforgiveness is one of the greatest roots of the cancer of unlove in the church. It's the biggest one that I can think of in many ways. When we hold on to anger against one another, when we hold on to those grudges, particularly when we've been in for a long time, what happens is it begins to, un- it begins to hurt us, and in turn, we can't be healthy towards others. 32, don't covet. 33, honor marriage. 34, lead like a servant. What if things were about serving others, not ourselves? 35, be a house of prayer. Again, the weakness, one of the great weaknesses of the church, one of our ineffectivenesses in love is that we don't partner with God where he's moving. 36, adding on to that, pray in faith. 37, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Surrender things to the right places. 38, love God with everything, your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 39, love your neighbor as yourself. Number 40, await Jesus' return. I mean, imagine if we actually lived like Jesus was coming back. Because surprise, he is. He's told us he's coming. What if we actually lived in anticipation? With not just waiting, kind of wondering, but active participation in the world with the expecting that he will come. And we don't know when that time will be. 41, take communion, because that not only connects us to God, but it reminds us of repentance and helps us connect with one another. 42, watch and pray. 43, go and lead people to Jesus and baptize them, actually leaving the church and going and doing things. 44, teach others to obey these commands. 45, that we keep these commands ourselves. 46, be born again. 47, feed his sheep. 48, bring in the poor into community. There's a lot we can learn from those who do not have as much as us. 49, receive God's power. Don't live out of your own strength, but live out of his. And number 50, abide in Jesus. The best way that we can learn to love others and to grow in our faith is to spend meaningful time, intentional time, with the root of all of that, love. 50 commandments of Jesus. Not easily done, but what's your one? What's one of those places that maybe you can surrender a part of your life over to Jesus? What's one of those places where you can change your disposition towards someone else in this room? Scribble it down, make a note on your phone. Write down that scripture verse. This week, ask God to reveal how you can apply it to your life. Because I got to tell you, I believe so deeply that if we could live this out, so much of the hurt and evil in the church could be undone. Because there is nothing that has been wrong that God cannot use for the good of those who love him. That's what scripture says. It's a promise. But the promise comes tied to these commands, that we pursue them. Yeah, Jesus will work out all those other things, but will we receive? Will we be a part of the goodness that comes as it's happening? Because he's still going to work it out all for his good, but if we're not joining him, we miss it. We miss out then on God. We miss out on the beauty that this community could be within our own church, between churches all across this city. I mean, I would love to see that not only do we release some of the tension and some of the the hurt and some of the barriers that hold us against one another, but even against some of us and the places we've come from. There's very few stories like Hannah, where Hannah shared today that she's been here since she was five months old. Most of us come from other places. And for some of us, that's just because we've moved here and we found a church. But for many others of us, we've come here because we've left other places. And sometimes we've left other places because hurt has been there. 
because of a lack of love. And the problem there is not just what's been done, but that we continue to carry that with us into this place. And unless we give forgiveness, unless we re- learn to love those who have hurt us, we can never be fully healthy here. We can never be truly planted in the love of this community because we're always going to be on guard. We're always going to have the gloves up. But as we can learn to surrender, as we can learn to realize that just as Jesus died for us, he's died for those others, forgiveness can happen. We don't love others because it benefits us. We love others because we have been the recipients of the benefit of what Jesus has done. And hopefully for every one of us, we are just so filled with God's love that we can't help but overflow it into the lives of those around us. So what's your one? Is it a commandment that you need to get closer to Jesus? By asking, seeking, knocking, coming to know him. Coming to receive the things that he would have for you. Is it by participating in the secret disciplines? Is it by intentionally spending time in, with spiritual practices? So that you get to know the mind of Jesus more. So that you get to understand his character. So that he begins to rub off on you. So that as you go out, you can rub that love off onto others. Is it that forgiveness piece? Is it that going to people who aren't like you? They're the command to bring in the poor. Those who are marginalized. Those who are far away from others within society, not because of things they've done, but because of circumstances? Is it learning to see a different part of society, a different type of people from you, who perhaps could then teach you a lot about love? Is it about just being intentional with the time that you've got here for an hour and a half or two hours on Sunday. To not just come in and receive and then to go out and go be on your own for however long until you come back to refill. But is it to actually look at someone else and to talk with them? But not talk at them, but with them. To hear them, to receive them to help them know that they are loved. What's your one? We're all desperate for something good in this world. And the reality is there's not a lot of places to go for it. So let's create the space and the relationships with the spirits leading towards something incredible towards a place where people from different lives and different segments of society and different backgrounds with different hurts, with different prejudices, with different issues can come to learn to love one another in the way that begins to undo all those things that aren't of God. In just a moment, we're going to sing some so- a song of worship again to appreciate God. We're going to place the emphasis on him. And the reason we're doing that isn't just because we want to sing another song. But it's the fact that we recognize that all of this flows from him. No matter how many of these commandments that you try to keep, you're never going to be good enough to be with God. But Jesus, out of his love for you, has reached down and brought you in. And so what we do in response is we just praise God. We worship him. We honor his love. And as we are reminded of it by our singing, as we are reminded of the hope, peace, joy, love, strength that comes 
into us from him, then hopefully we're filled up some more so we can pour it out to those around us. And then when we're done singing, I have a bit of a challenge for us. I would love for you to find one person that's here today and just share what your one is. Have somebody to hold you accountable. Have someone pray for you as you try to live out this command so that we can show love even in that moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. God, it's amazing that the creator and sustainer of our, of our universe, the person who has made everything around us, the things that we can see, the things that we can't see, God, that you care about us. Jesus, that you came to live in, in the flesh, Lord, to live as one of us. Ugh. I can't imagine that you would want to do that, but you love us. You care for us. You've come into our world. You've lived a life like us, but done it so much better. And God, we thank you from that place that you died for us. God, we know that we aren't deserving of it. We know that we, are, we were far from you, that we were always going to be far from you before you did that. But God, that you died for us, that you rose for us, that you've made a way for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you live in us. That you haven't left us just because you've made us right and then said, hey, go do all these things. But that you as the truth live in us and help us to walk this out. That you help us learn how we can show love to one another. God, I pray that we would be a people of great love. And God, I, I know that there's already great things happening in our church. God, I thank you for those who are already so exemplary at, at loving others. For people who think regularly to pray for other people. To people who visit people who are sick or can't, can't come on Sundays. To people who cook others food. To people who serve in different ministries. To people who do background stuff. To people who clean. To people who who are just there for us, to people who organize things, to the people who teach us, to the people who greet us. God, we thank you for that love. Thank you for that grace of one another. And God, I just pray that as we grow in it, that the already amazing things that are happening would seem so small because we would grow into so much love. And God, that every one of us would have a place to take part in that. God, will we recognize our place, that there's not one person in this room who's here by accident. There's not one person who's here in this room that doesn't have some love to give that someone else in this room also needs. God, we love you. We want to love like you. Help us in this. We pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.